Long before the Swiss Alps became known as a skiing and hiking destination, ingeniously designed stilted barns sustained entire communities. Blackened by the sun, stilted pitched roof barns seemingly floated above the flower strewn meadows, framed by the Matterhorn, Switzerland's famed pyramidical peak. On closer inspection, I discovered the barn's facades were festooned with weather worn sides, pitchforks, and even a toboggan like contraption used to transport hay. These centuries old staddles, grain storage barns, are an intrinsic part of the landscape and still freckle the landlocked country's high alpine valleys. Many of them are located in Zermatt, a resort town located in southern Switzerland's Valais region, and the barns have borne witness to the moneyed ski and hiking destination's humble beginnings as a farming community. Beyond their rural romanticism, these monuments to the past served a very practical purpose, to feed self-sustaining mountain communities. I look at the Staddles and I think, how romantic, and, what, a hard life, said Zermatt-born Linda Biner. Her nonagenarian father, Thomas Biner, nodded knowingly from his rocking chair, telling me, there was no rice in Switzerland back then. At just 14 years old, he recalled hiking over Zermatt's 3, 300 m high theodal pass to Italy's Aosta Valley to trade tobacco for the priced grain. My, widowed, mother had six children, four cows, three goats, and not a penny, he continued. Far from being shackled to the stove, women toiled the land too, even braving avalanche paths to tend to their livestock. From the age of eight, Thomas learned to milk cows on Zermatt's high pastures. Summers were spent sleeping on a bed of straw, used as winter fodder for the animals, in the upper part of the family's two-story stable, known as a gaudy. This simple yet ingenious construction kept him warm by harnessing heat from the cattle below. Moving in sync with the seasons wasn't just a way of life, but a means of survival. It goes to explain the strategic placement of these traditional gaudies and staddles, which tumble down from the steep slopes to the undulating meadows below. Zermatt, which translates as by or on the meadow, was originally a handful of hamlets scattered over some 60,000 acres. The Biner family owned 10 barns just for stockpiling rye. Nicknamed the sleeping grain by alpine farmers, it would hibernate under the first flush of snow after being sown in September, and was hand-cut the following August to be hoarded for the long winter ahead. Pest and damp proofing the precious cereal was another matter. Farmer's Kenny solution was to elevate their granaries several feet above the ground on mushroom-like stilts topped with huge circular slabs of locally sourced schist rock. The barn's rose-hued, resin-rich timber was felled from local larch that's particularly resistant to rye-loving rodents that are repelled by its strong scent. The distinctive silhouette of these age-old grain barns even inspired the logo for Zermatt's 3.7 km long culture trail. Inaugurated in 2019, the trail steadily climbs 300m from the town center to Zmut, one of the Alps' earliest built hamlets. I was thinking one day, where are the oldest buildings, in the valley, president of Zermatt's Cultural and Historical Society, René Biner, unrelated to Thomas and Linda, told me, as we walked along the trail that snakes past a 700-year-old barn, only recently dated thanks to dendrochronology. Owners have neglected the staddles in the last 30 to 40 years, he added, explaining that many no longer serve a practical use since very little rye is now harvested, and are therefore abandoned. This, combined with the fact that there is no financial incentive to restore them, since local law prohibits the conversion of agricultural buildings into residential dwellings, makes their ongoing maintenance a challenge. With the exception of Gaudis, a handful of which provide refuge for the Valais' famously friendly, curly-fringed black-nosed sheep during Zermatt's bitter winters, the majority of these barn-like structures lie abandoned. René is on a mission to remedy this. When we reached Smut, he revealed the bundles of freshly harvested rice sheaths stored in a friend's staddle that he plans to use to make traditional roggenbrot, rye bread. His forefathers would have collected their flour from Zermatt's only mill before baking loaves in communal ovens shared by up to 20 people. As recently as the 1940s, grain was grown at 2000 women's mutt, where stones demarcating locals' land are still visible. A single family would have typically owned several dozen small parcels, dispersed to prevent a rockfall or avalanche from decimating their entire harvest. However, when the train was built, in 1891, it was cheaper to buy the cereal from down the valley, René said. The steady decline in farming continued as alpine tourism took off in the 20th century, 
with World War II finally snuffing out Zermatt's agrarian way of life. For local hotelier and restauranteur Sandrine Julin, a descendant of one of Zermatt's founding families, the Staddles connect her with her heritage. As a child, I remember walking through the Staddles with my grandfather, him telling me the stories of his upbringing. They form a part of our history, and it's a constant reminder that we shall not forget where we came from, she told me. In the wine-growing village of Visper Terminen, the gateway to the Valais Visper Valley, a clutch of dilapidated grain barns is being repurposed for social good. It's part of a decade-old non-profit called Chinderwald, founded by retired Professor Julian von Saddle. All these old barns were unused, so I asked, what can we do to preserve them, the local told me. With the help of several artists and architects, he has transformed them into five themed indoor playgrounds, and for a nominal fee of 10 Swiss francs, 9 pounds, children can spend three hours flitting between them. We shuffled along the original threshing corridor where farmers once flailed the rye, bisecting a space-themed staddle annexed to another grain barn packed to its 17th-century rafters with vintage paraphernalia, like a winwana. Used to separate the chaff from the grain kernels long ago, the instrument has since been upcycled into a flying dragon. The project's important for the life of the village, Bum Saddle said. It's also helping to show the old way of life, added Visper Terminen born interior architect Judith Kreutzer, who's in the throes of renovating the project's sixth barn. Bum Saddle counts himself among the eight out of ten villagers who air dry their meat as their ancestors did in spikers' storerooms. These seasonal fridges of yesteryear were also balanced on stilted stones to prevent ground moisture from spoiling the meat. But air circulating gaps between the floor panels differentiates them from their grain caching cousins. Wind whistled through the cracks as Von Saddle pulled out a giant skeleton key to his family's sixth generation spiker. Hung from the ceiling joists were butcher style hooks where Von Saddle's hunter brother Drykir's game like roe deer and chamois, a goat like antelope, from October. 75 kilometers away in the French-speaking valley of Val de Herens, six ancient grain barns, referred to locally as records, were spared demolition thanks to Swiss architect Olivier Chassos. He eyed them a decade ago while paragliding over the village of Eveline. Our ancestors built perfectly in harmony with nature, cutting wood in the right season, he said. Virtually unchanged from the outside, inside, the self-catering huts have been contemporized in Chassos's signature pared-back style, with smooth concrete floors and spruce wood walls. I quickly realized that the laws did not allow me to transform the buildings because they were in an agricultural zone. So, I decided to save heritage from ruin by using the philosophy of our ancestors, that is, by moving them, to the pocket-sized village of La Forclaise, which is outside the agricultural zone, he told me. During the Little Ice Age, from the 14th to 19th centuries, Swiss farmers frequently dismantled their barns and re-erected them away from advancing glaciers. Few have traveled the distance that Nicola Cap's 150-year-old stilted barn has. Nestled in the back garden of the former banker's Zermatt home is a 4.5 MX5 M. Gotti transplanted from the village of Eisen in the neighboring Sauce Valley. We had to fly everything in on a helicopter, she told me pointing out the original wooden crucifix still affixed to the large facade. We numbered each piece of wood and even used some of the authentic nails, she explained of the painstaking four-month-long restoration project undertaken in 2008. A labor of love, its Heidi-esque interior has made two-storied Kalu Gotti an instant hit on Airbnb. My heart opens when I see the Matterhorn, cap set of the gingham curtain-framed view of the snaggletoothed peak. My own gaze was drawn to the sunburnt, stilted barns in the foreground. Though dwarfed by the snow-capped mountain, they still stand defiant centuries later, and hopefully for several more centuries to come.